All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our students online as well. All right, let's just quickly begin this time with a word of prayer and we'll get into our teaching. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, Lord, and uh, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for what you've done, oh God, for us. Lord, even as we come together to learn about our identity, who we are in you, Lord, we pray that uh, everything that we learn will be seeds sown in our hearts, oh God, to bear fruit in our lives. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done and everything that you're doing in our lives, Lord. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So last class we did quite a few uh, chapters. Uh, and so we have we stopped at, uh, I think it was chapter 15, that we are new creatures in our spirit. Uh, we looked at uh, what the Apostle Paul said. He in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, he says, May the God of peace sanctify you completely, your spirit, soul, and body. So we also establish the fact that as believers, you know, the Holy Spirit can speak to us, minister to us in our spirit, soul, and body. Right? So we are three-part being. We have a spirit. We have a soul. We live in a body. Right? So the Holy Spirit... You know, every time we pray, every time we worship God, we're spending time in God's presence, He can speak to us through any of these three means. Spirit, soul, and body, right? We can feel a physical sensation of the Holy Spirit. He can minister to our, to our soul, which is our emotions, our mind, our will, our emotions. And then He can minister to us to, to our spirit. Right, uh, And then we also very importantly looked at last class, the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians, he says, we have to put on some things, remember the jacket? How many of you remember that example? Right, You put on the jacket, meaning you put on the things of God, and you put off, you take off the things of the flesh. Take off the things that is, uh, you know, worldly things, you take it off, you put on the things of God, right? Okay, let's go to chapter 16, new species, right? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, all things have passed away and all things have become new. Now, there are two main Greek words used in this passage, right? The first Greek word is kainos, referring to uh, something new in quality, in nature, in character. So when, when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, when we become believers, our character or our quality changes, right? Everyone say character. Right? Character is who we are when nobody is watching. Right? That's, that's our character, our real character. Now, in front of people, we can say, Jai Masiki, praise the Lord. But a real character is who we are when nobody is watching us. When we're alone in the room, what are we? That's a real character, right? Now, in the old, uh, when, in the old person, when we were unbelievers, or we were not you know, walking in line with God's word, we would follow the things of the flesh, right? We, we had a different character. Our nature, our essence was different, right? Picture this. Uh, maybe you know your a friend of yours says, oh, "Hey, you, no, you start an argument with your friend. You get really angry. We start a fight." But after becoming believers, all of a sudden you don't want to fight. Oh, okay, it's okay. Let it be. I don't want to waste my time arguing. I don't want to. What happened? The same thing before was you know ready to get angry and shout to start a fight. But the same thing here. Why? Because the nature has changed, right? The character has changed. And that's what it is. The first one is kainos, which is your nature, your quality, your essence, your character. If your character, after becoming a believer, has not changed, right? Now, I'm not saying that, you know, immediately you'll see a change. Paul says in Romans 12, he says, we have to 
we are changing we have to conform ourselves not to this world but transform ourselves by the renewing of your mind but very important point is a very important um, factor to keep in mind is that if i am still if i still have the character of that when i was an unbeliever i must make the change i must go back to god and say god these are certain things in my life i have to change i have to take this out it is not from you right now for example 20 years right example a 40 year old man right or anybody a 40 year old person for 20 or 30 years he's been a person who would always speak bad language just an example right 20 30 years he's speaking bad language now what has happened he's become a believer right now after becoming a believer because he's been using bad language for 25 30 years it may come out naturally right naturally those sometimes those bad words come out now if there is no conviction if we feel that okay it's all right to use these bad words then there is no change in character there's no change in quality right but if if a believer if a person who's 20 25 years who've been using bad words but suddenly a bad word comes out what happens if there's conviction god this is something i should not have said please forgive me help me to control my tongue help me to speak what is important uh, remove these bad words from my mouth that comes out automatically help me to speak only the words of truth speak of god's word because death and life are in the power of your of my tongue when i do that all of a sudden you will notice that bad words won't come it it may take time but eventually your character has changed and your friends would have seen you using hundreds of bad words or saying wrong things getting angry every time the same friends will see you and say what happened to you how come you don't use any bad words how come you're not uh, you know you're not coming out with us you're you're not uh, you know mingling with us what happened your character has changed you say yes because kainos when the holy spirit comes there's a change in nature there's a change in character there is no change you really have to question yourself you go back and ask god god change me change these things in my life right and the second word used is neos right neos referring to something new in time young younger and both these words refer to a new creation what is the first greek word I mean, you don't have to know the greek word but the meaning of it the essence of that word is very important I become a believer kainos everyone say kainos which is new character and then there is neos which is a uh, uh, new in time being young so when you and i become believers what does paul say he writes to the corinthians and he says you all are babies in christ right so in the spirit they are young they are new they're just born it's a new birth we become a born again believer right now imagine this there's a born again believer i make them sit make that person sit and i start teaching them revelations what is going to happen in the end times or i start teaching about all you know old testament all those sacrifices leviticus you know all these things if i start teaching what is going to happen it's like taking in the natural it's like taking a baby and giving chicken to the baby what will the baby do the baby doesn't have teeth even if you shove chicken put chicken into the baby's mouth and it goes into the stomach there's going to be a problem because of indigestion the the, the baby can get choked the baby can have severe stomach pain and many things can happen it can also cause a lot of damage to the baby right the internal organs are very weak so what do what does a what do people do with the baby liquids milk and then once the baby is six months old you give one biscuit right now 
when I had my first son, I was 26 years old. 26 years old, I didn't know what to do with the baby. I was very young. Uh, what, what to do with this baby? Right. So, milk. Right. Milk. Then after six six months, give a little biscuit. Then mix the biscuit with the milk. Make it a little thick. Then you have all these other foods, baby foods, according to age. That's in the natural. In the spiritual, it's the same thing. The more I eat and drink of the word of God, the more I'm going to grow stronger. Now, if I don't eat and drink, imagine a child, doesn't, a baby doesn't eat and drink, what will happen? It'll, it'll very easily die. The baby will pass away because they need nutrition. That is very important phase. The initial phase is very, very important. Now, if I don't read the word of God, if I don't spend time in God's presence, if I don't pray, I'll remain a baby. And who would want to be a baby all, all our life? So Jesus, is, the word here is saying, you're born again. So you're a new creature. You're a new creation. You're a baby in Christ. And then we grow. We study God's word. We spend time in God's presence. We develop ourselves. None of us can say after becoming believers, oh, I understood everything. None of us can say that, right? Even, you know, we may be 30, 40 years in the Lord, there is still so much to learn from God's word. Right? But we grow into the things of God. Then the next Greek word is kainos, uh, used in new creation. Kainos means new man, a new inner man. We're not talking about a physical man, but an inner man. When you look at the scriptures in the New Testament, it teaches us that the Holy Spirit is, the, the Spirit inside us is called the inner man. This is the outer man, the body, the inner man, the spirit. Remember we talked about it? We are spirit living in a body. So whoever we are, what we are is our spirit inside us. This is just the function that we have, right? The mind, so for example, if we look at the CNS, the central nervous system, in our body, we have the central nervous system, right? If you want to open your Bible, I'll say, okay, open John 3.16. It goes straight into your central nervous system. Now, what does the nervous system do? It'll say, move your hand. Open the Bible. All the, the nervous system is saying all that. The nerves in your central nervous system is telling you, move your hand, open the Bible, and open to John 3.16. Once you find it, what does your central nervous system say? Read. But some of us will say, no. But you say, OK, read. And you begin to read. What is that? That is your central nervous system that's functioning your whole body. In the same way, your inner man, there's an inner spirit. When we read the word of God, when we pray, What's happening? We are activating that central nervous system. We're telling the Holy Spirit, Minister, speak to my spirit. Remember this. <laughs> what is of the flesh will give birth to flesh. What is of the spirit will give birth to the spirit. When we do things in the flesh, it will not result much. Even if it does, in God's presence, it will burn away. But what is of the Spirit will have eternal fruit. Right? Here, the, the, the word new man is the new inner person inside of us. The old man began back in the time when Adam was sinful in nature. The new man begins in Jesus, that is, in the nature of God. The old man, Adam, God created Adam and Eve, and he didn't create them as sinners. Yes, right? He didn't create Adam and Eve and say, okay, you all are sinners now, but because I'm here, you all are holy. No. Created them, and there was nothing wrong with them. The Bible says that God would meet with them in the cool of the evening, or in the cool of the day. He would meet with Adam and Eve. Meet with Adam, right? But here, after sin, there was separation. 
again this new this inner man that we have right now is the nature of Jesus everyone say I have the nature of Jesus online online students as well you can say it in your rooms wherever you are I have the nature of Jesus say it again yes why because the spirit of Jesus the, the inner man carries the new nature not the nature of Adam but the nature of Jesus what is the nature of Jesus how did he walk? He walked in power, he walked in love, he walked in authority, he walked in compassion. Right? That nature is in us. But some of us may say, but I'm I'm you know, I I know many believers, they are not walking in the nature of Jesus. That's because we have opened, you know, the doors to the enemy to come and work. But we have that nature. We have to build on it. Right? So our genetics, the word genetics means uh, something that is already in us. So, for example, uh, the genes, you know, you look at a gene, the DNA of a person, right? You've got parents, the children, they have the same DNA, right? The genes will be the same. Why do you think uh, the, a, a child born can look like the father and the mother? They look like both of them. One angle you see, they look like the father. The other angle you see, they look like the mother. Why? Because the genes is mixed. The genes of the parents are there. Right now, you and I have a natural gene. We may look like our parents. But we have the genes of Jesus. His DNA is inside us. His presence is inside us. And he calls us his children. So we have the DNA. We have to walk as children of God. Okay? Let's look at the next one. Again, a new identity. Now, a lot of this may be repeated, but I want us to read Ephesians in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Let's read this powerful chapter, right? Ephesians, chapter 2. I'll just give you the verse. Yeah. Uh, we can do 1, 2, maybe. Let's do 1, 2. 10 and then we'll read 11 onwards as well later on so let's do uh, Ephesians chapter 2 1 to 10 and we'll break it down anyone can read and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin in which you walk according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised, up, uh, raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages of ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are uh, his workmanship create, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Yes. Right? So... He goes on to talk about what happens. Now, what is happening here? The Lord Jesus, when he gives us an identity, new identity, he makes us something that we are not. Okay? Now, imagine this, right? Just an example, just to help us understand. Imagine you are not a police officer. Right? And we are not a police officer, right? But if you put on the police officer's dress, the, the entire uniform and we you know and we meet with people they'll think we're a police officer that's identity theft but I'm just giving you an example right Jesus made us something that we were not 
in what sense are we sinners are we righteous are we just as if we haven't justified are we yes or no no right. are we justified have we sinned or no are we righteous if you look at it in the natural sense are we righteous are we sinners yes so now jesus is saying hey in this new identity you are righteous but it's not all right actually we are not righteous because of what has happened we are sinners so but when jesus gives us this identity he is changing it he is saying in the natural may not be but what i am saying as a new identity you are righteous you are just as if you have not sinned so what is paul is saying here he's talking to these believers in ephesians ephesus these believers are people who have been living in sexual immorality idol worship there are there's prostitution there's you know there's uh, if you look at acts we see that ephesus was a harbor right so there was a lot of business trade a lot of um, you know a uh, lot of evil in that place now these people have become believers and they're going to church paul is saying 2 verse 1 he says as for you people you all of you who are in the church he's writing to the church as for you you were dead in transgressions and sins right you were dead in your transgressions and sins but i made you alive you're no longer dead in sin you're no longer living in sin i made you alive in christ right what is the next one he says let's read ephesians 2:13 but now in christ jesus you who once were fair of have been brought near by the blood of christ yeah but now in christ jesus you who were once far away has been brought close through the blood of christ now do you all have old testament survey going on in the Yeah, I was studying about the outer courts, inner courts, and the most holy place, all of that, right? So there was separation between God and man, right? God, man could not just go and say, "God, please help me." No, there was a separation at that time. Now, through the blood of Jesus, we who were once far away from God are brought close to Christ. Now, who did it? Jesus did it. not our work jesus did it right so if we look at it in the natural we may feel you know when we sin how many of us feel we are far away from god oh god i've sinned shouldn't have done that we feel far away in the natural we may feel that way our, our life may feel that way but in the spirit jesus is saying through the blood i have brought you close i brought you to me i've gathered you to me is again change their identity but let's look at the next one ephesians 2:19 consequently you are no longer foreigners and aliens but fellow citizens of god's people and members of god's household you are no longer foreigners you are no longer aliens you are no longer uh, people who have who are strangers away from from you know from christ away from the kingdom of god but now as believers you have been brought close you and you are part of a family you are part of the you are members of christ stick the mic right uh. we are new creations in christ and at times we backslide yeah. so how do you address that yes that's a, that's a very good question now we know that the enemy the enemy is doing his work right he's an accuser of the brethren he accuses us 
he tells us you know hey you did this wrong you did this wrong and it's a natural feeling to say oh yes i did this wrong so that is the time when we have to stand not on our own strength but we can stand on god's word now why do people backslide why do people give up why do people you know they have been believers for years especially they say hey i don't believe in jesus now why does that happen whose work is that it cannot be their own work it is the work of the devil that he puts these seeds into our heart it is very easy for us to not believe in jesus don't you feel that yes or no it's very easy imagine some people come and say you know uh, jesus it, it's it's not true where's the proof where's the proof about this right so it's very easy for the enemy to bring accusations to he's a master in deception picture this adam and eve are there right what what, what does he say to adam he says I think you can have the fruit you have it you'll become god or or maybe god doesn't want you to have it because you'll get all the power of god he's a master of deception he knows how to divert our thoughts and our minds but remember this he who is in us is greater than he that is in the world right so when people especially believers they backslide it is not their own doing now we we know that the holy spirit is there right maybe you know reminding them saying you know don't do this he who was in us is greater than yeah he who is in us is greater than he that is in the world right so the choice is ours the holy spirit will not force us no you have to believe you already took water baptism you already confessed your sins don't go back. he's not going to force us he's never going to do that so it is up to us always remember this life is a choice right we choose what we want whether we want to go do this or whether we do that and god gives the choice so when it comes to backsliding the most that we can do is you know it's painful to see people backsliding but we can pray for them that the holy spirit will minister to them but if they are you know and remember that god is able to restore no matter what uh but we cannot force them the holy spirit also will not force them right because they know everything but it's all you know covered up that the enemy tries to make that person not believe in this word so it's 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 sad i mean it's sad to think of it uh, when people are backsliding but uh, we can only pray that the holy spirit ministers to them right okay let's read ephesians 5:8 For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You were once darkness, so now walk as light. Right. So, how does it feel to live in darkness? Right. We were once darkness in the sense we were living in sin. Sin is living in darkness. we can't see the light what did jesus say you will be the light to the gentiles you are the light of the world right now when i when we say you are darkness doesn't mean you you'll be sitting in darkness the whole time right it means in the spiritual realm you are in darkness he got the enemy is trying to do everything that he can right to keep you in that darkness he doesn't want you to know about the power of the gospel He doesn't want you to declare God's word. He doesn't want us to do this. So he'll keep us in darkness. He'll keep us. What's he doing now? You know, when we look at around us, uh, we have all all kinds of things happening. You know what's what's the sad part now? The enemy is not looking at age and all. He's targeting even children, seven years, eight years old. just two weeks back uh, uh, i got a call from one of our, uh, one family and a uh, couple of weeks back uh, and this mother said my daughter is 9 years old 
and she's addicted to pornography. She, she watches pornography. What do I do? How many years old? Nine. You think the devil cares about age? No. And he wants to keep people in that darkness. But once we become believers, he takes us out of that darkness and puts us in the light. But if we are more interested in the darkness, we can go back and sit in the darkness. That is called backsliding. Now in the darkness, there's nice, a lot of enjoyment. You can fulfill the desires of your flesh, fulfill, you know, enjoy life, good fun. Now in the light, there's no fun. If you're old, we can't go out for party. We can't drink. We can't do this. We can't. Everything is, you know, read the word, pray. That life was better. If we run back to the darkness, whose fault is it? Is it our fault or is it, uh, can we blame God? Right? So he took us from a place of darkness and he put us into light. Look at that list there. We were once sinners, but now in Christ we are saints. We were once guilty, but now in Christ we are justified. Right? We were once the unrighteousness of but now, in Christ, we are the righteousness of God, the right standing before God. We were condemned, but now we are justified. The old covenant is the covenant of condemnation. Right? It's a covenant of condemnation. What is condemnation? You are like this. You will never be holy. You will never do well in life. You will always be a failure. That is called condemnation. You will never be able to sing. You will never be able to be fruitful in life. You will always be poor. You will always have this kind of life. You will never be prosperous. That's called condemnation. Teachers can bring condemnation. Parents can sometimes bring condemnation. Friends can bring condemnation. The devil's work is to bring condemnation. It always says, you are nothing. Or if we are living in sin, sometimes he'll say, okay, you do whatever you want to do. He'll not bother us. Anyways, he's living in sin, so no problem. But now in Christ Jesus, once we were condemned, now we are in, not in condemnation. Nowhere will Jesus say, this is what you did wrong. He brings conviction but not condemnation. Remember the example we talked about uh, last class about Peter? Did Jesus condemn Peter and say, Peter, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Why were you not there? When the Holy Spirit ministers to us, he brings conviction. Right, let's read this verse. I forget where it is. Uh, Romans 8. I think it's Romans 8.28. Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Yeah. There is therefore now. Everyone say now. Not tomorrow, not one week later, not one year later. Not till, you know, till water baptism. Not till you give, get the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now. Therefore, now there is no condemnation. This morning, we may have got, may have sinned. You may have sinned, we may have sinned in the tea break. Right? Now there is no condemnation. The Holy Spirit will bring conviction. Are you understanding the difference here? He'll say, hey, what you said was wrong. You shouldn't have said that. Or what you did was wrong. You shouldn't have done that. Okay, Jesus, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Once you ask for forgiveness, there is no condemnation. Now the devil will come and say, but you did this wrong. Last week you did that wrong. And the previous month you did this wrong. You say, devil, now there is no condemnation. Use the word of God to attack the works of the enemy. Use the word of God to attack his plans and schemes. He will try to 
expose you. He'll try to, you know, uh, make you feel that you're unworthy. You say, I may feel that way, but what does it say? By faith I'm receiving that I'm righteous, I'm sanctified, justified, I'm the righteousness of God. I'm not living in darkness, I'm living in light. We have to say it. We have to speak it. Right? So never as believers, the you know, one of the most common things that believers say and do is they say, Oh, the, I it was too much. The temptation was very strong, so I could not bear it. Now, true, temptation was temptations will come. But there's a choice. You can use God's word. Jesus set the example, use God's word, and he was able to defeat the enemy. Let's read the, in Revelations. There's a verse there in Revelations. Revelations. Get the verse. Oh, I forget the verse, but it says the book of Revelations. Uh, I'll give you the chapter and verse later. But it says, We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Okay, I'll give you the verse later. Right? We overcome the enemy. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So the enemy will come. We can overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. We can speak the blood of Jesus. Say, I cover my mind with the blood of Jesus. I cover my thoughts. I cover my, my body. I cover myself with the blood of Jesus. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. You speak the word of God. You speak your testimony. What is your testimony? Don't say I was, you know, I was in uh, working in the fields. The Holy Spirit came. No, that's not your testimony. Your testimony is you're a believer. You have a new identity. You have all of these things which God has given to us. That's your testimony. Now, the best part about testimony is we must believe that this is our testimony. If I don't believe the testimony, what will happen? It'll be of no use. It'll be you will not even know that this is a testimony. We will overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And uh, later on, you will also learn how to overcome temptations and all of that. Yes, Revelations 12, 11. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. It has it there. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Right? Okay. So the Apostle Paul instructs that we must live according to our new identity. Let's read Ephesians 5 8. It says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are in the light. Walk as children of the light. Now, the word walk here literally means to live your life. Right? Live your life as if you're uh, children of the light. Right? Align yourself to the new identity. Change your self-image. Don't look at what you are in the natural. Right? Don't look at what you have, material belongings, or the, the, the clothes you wear, the car you drive, the bike you have, the house you have. All of that is important. But that is not your identity. Align yourself to the identity which God has given you. Right? As people of, of, who are in Christ, things have changed. We have a new identity. And this is something that we must understand and we must embrace. What's the word embrace means? Embrace means to hug somebody. right? When you, when you hug somebody, you're embracing them. right? So you must embrace your new identity. Right? Now, for example, it's your birthday. And when it's your birthday, they'll say, okay, make you stand, okay, cut cake, sing a song, happy birthday song. What do you say? Hey, no, don't sing for me. It's not my birthday. But it is your birthday. 
So don't sing for me. So I don't want to, I don't want birthday. Now what's happening? You're not embracing yourself. It's your birthday. You're not identifying, you're not understanding it's your birthday. I know it may be a weird example, but it's true. Now, if I know my what I have, I will embrace it. I know that I'm a child of God. I know that sometimes I may make mistakes, but I can go run back to God's presence. I know that I have to, you know, that God has given me the authority. I know that my standing is in the natural, I'm here, but I'm I'm with Jesus. I'm seated with him. I know that the spirit inside me is greater than the spirit that is in the world. I know the authority that Jesus is giving me, but I'll have to embrace it. What is the meaning of authority? Jesus says, no, I've given you the keys. Keys means authority. And let's look at this example. Imagine all of us were outside. Right? And I give one of you the keys, right? I, the, the Bible college keys, and it's locked. Right? And so all the students have come and we are waiting outside. Right? Because the key is locked. We can't get in now. Right? But one of you has the key. So what's your name? Moses. So Moses has the key, for example. Right? And Moses also is standing there with everyone. Who has the key? He said they gave it to Moses. Moses, where's the Bible college key? I have it with me. So why aren't you opening the, uh, the, the, the gate? No, no, I have the key. I have the authority. I will open when I want to open. Does it make sense? It doesn't make sense. Why? He has the key. He has the authority, but he's not using it. All of the students are standing outside. One is you'll tell them, hey, you give the key to me. I'll open it. Or you will forcefully take the key away from him. The point is, authority is given, but we have to use it. Jesus says, I've given you the authority. I don't keep the authority in our pocket and say, I have the authority. No, we got to use it. You get what I'm saying? Right? We have to use that authority. And then we'll begin to see the work of God. Otherwise, how will we see the work of God? See. But you'll be a believer? Yes. That will not change. But God doesn't want you to just be believers. He wants to do, he's giving you authority. He's giving you something more than that. Right? It's not that, okay, I can enter heaven and, okay, my life is done. No. He's giving you dominion. He's giving you authority over the devil. When you see the devil being defeated, right? when you overcome temptations, it's like you're telling the devil you're defeated. I have defeated you. So God is pleased with that when we use the authority. If not, God would have said, okay, Jesus would have said, you just believe, you'll get the Holy Spirit, then I'll see you in heaven. That's not what he said. He says, hey, I'm giving you the authority. Go do what I, what I did. Go use the authority. Use my name. Right? And so when, when you and I understand this, we begin to embrace things of God. Working of miracles. The things that God can do, He can speak prophetic words. He can minister. He can. He can. He gives us the strength to overcome things in life. But we have to use it, right? Recognize and embrace your identity and inheritance as new creation. Call yourself as who God has declared you to be. God is saying you are a child of God. Don't say, God, I'm a worm. I'm a centipede. I'm like a red ant that is walking everywhere. That's not what you are. You may feel that way, but Jesus is saying, you're a child of God. That's your identity. Don't say, oh, I'm so bad. I'm, I, 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 no, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm such a small person. Uh, I, I don't know this. I don't, don't say, what well, I don't know. Say, God, I don't know, but you're going to teach me. You're going to empower me. You're going to make me do things by your spirit. Right? You get what I'm saying? Right? So don't go by the natural. Go by what God can do in your life. Right? Call yourself who God has declared you to be. Remember 
that when you call yourself who you are, it is Christ dwelling inside you. It's Christ dwelling inside you. Every morning when you wake up, you may have, be having a bad day. Now God's attitude does not change. God is the same. God doesn't get up with bad, uh, bad mood. right? He gets up the same way. He loves us every day. The same way he loves us. It doesn't change. Some of us here, you know, we'll get up one day angry. We don't want to talk to anyone. We'll get up one day, we want to talk to everyone. We'll get up another day, you don't want to see anyone. Because we have emotions, we are like that. But God is not like that. God is the same. You sin, I sin, he still loves us. He still cares for us. When he sees us, he sees us like he's seeing Jesus in us. Can God hate Jesus? Christ in us. When God sees us, he sees Christ in us. Right? So you know your identity, walk in your identity. Okay? All right. Any questions? All right. All right. So let's close. And uh, thank you, students online. Thank you so much. We will meet next week.